Uh, but first, our top story, the railroads and uh, what is going on there with arbitration looming. They walk away from the bargaining table, both sides. Let's bring on Joanna Marsh and let's talk about what's going on there. Joanna, how are you this morning? Good. How are you both? Doing excellent. We are doing pretty good. And the story is really, really interesting. We've got some negotiations that have been going on for quite a while. And now they've kind of hit the stalemate. We're walking away from the negotiation table. Give us a little bit of background about what's going on between the railroad and the union and how we've gotten to this point. Sure, sure, yeah. So um, so the contract, the union's contract ended um, uh, December 2019 or at the end of the 2019. And so uh, the unions have been working uh, without a contract um, since then, since January 2020. And, um, and both parties have been negotiating um, for a new contract uh, since then. And um, I, earlier this year, in, uh, in early 2022, um, the union unions sought uh, uh, mediation uh, through the Federal Mediation Board. And so uh, they've been trying to have uh, talks, um, but uh, the Mediation Board um, this week uh, offered um, uh, arbitration um, provided by the board for both parties. So that's what's going on. So, Joanna, what's, what's the argument here? Is it all just straight up wages or what's the sticking points? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, wages is one issue. Um, another issue is health care. Uh, the railroads argue um, that uh, the health care that's being provided, um, is, there have been changes, uh, you know, throughout various industries about like what um, what healthcare options are provided, and the market now um, is a little bit different, and so the railroad industry um, hasn't been immune to those changes, and so they're trying to. Uh, what the railroads say is that they're trying to modernize um, what healthcare um, uh, uh, options and benefits are provided to the rail uh, railroad workers. But the really big issue actually is um, sort of technology and uh, train crew size. Um, so right now, uh, at least. Um, Two people must be um, in a locomotive cab, the locomotive engineer and the conductor. And what the railroads want is to have, you know, of course, the locomotive engineer, but then have the conductor um, be redeployed from the train cab uh, to on the ground and to have that position uh, potentially be more of like a... a tip, more typical, <laughs> typical, like nine to five job, whereas... Um, the engineer would probably continue the the uh, sort of current work schedule that uh, they have. So um, so that's the um, what the railroads are calling for, and the unions mm -hmm. are, um, pushing back against that. Oh, sorry. I was just uh, on that on that point there. The conductor. So it, would that reduce the number of conductors that are needed because they could potentially uh, uh, manage more than just the one train that they would be on? Is that what the issue is there? Because if I was a conductor, I'd be like, heck yeah, man, nine to five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I know. I mean, you know, both, there there are definitely you know, arguments going both ways um, because obviously the the railroads um, they're having issues uh, trying to um, attract new talent, uh, and part of it is this perception that that the railroading life is is pretty hard because the schedules, you know, you're on call for for you know several days um, uh, consecutively or something like that. So uh, the railroads are saying, well, wouldn't this be nice to have um, at least some people have some more regularity in terms of like what their day looks like? Mm -hmm. But um, the, yeah, but the unions argue that you know it's it's important to have um, at least two people on a train, especially because um, some of the trains. And I don't think I mean I don't think that the uh, if if it does go to one person in a cab, I don't think it's going to be for all routes. So it, you know it just depends. So I mean they'll you know it just it really depends on 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 the network um, needs. But um, but the unions argue that uh, that. It's important to have uh, at least two people on, um, partly because you know the trains are much longer now, and if there is um, something wrong or something that needs to be checked uh, on the train, you know they might have to walk, you know, quite a quite a way, <laughs> and then there's not going to be anyone um, uh, there on in, in the locomotive cab, and so yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the unions yeah. worried about safety yeah. there, and not Absolutely. and not number of yeah. jobs. Yeah. That'd so, Joanna, going problem. forward now, if both sides don't agree to this binding arbitration, what happens next? What are the next steps? 
Sure, sure. So, um, so if they don't agree to the binding arbitration, there's going like a, be a, a thirty day off, thirty days cooling period. Um, so you know, to get, everyone can get ready for the next step, which is uh, the president Joe Biden could could appoint. Um, kind of point a board that will um, kind of look at everything and then uh, make a report that would issue recommendations and then, um, you know, and then the both sides can decide whether to take those recommendations or, you know, what to do with that. So that's one thing. Um, of course, during this time, Congress could also intervene um, and, you know, provide its uh, recommendations about what should happen next. So, and it was, it, yeah, so it'll be interesting because um, I think the unions uh, have been wanting, in, in my take of things, the unions have been kind of uh, aiming for, for this um the direction of, of things to go this way. So, yeah, but I mean, it's hard for the union to to open that door for uh, removing someone from the cab. Uh, that's a got to be a major thing because I mean, part of their thing is is retention of jobs. And once you open up that door, it's a slippery slope. And I'm sure they're they're looking at that with all the tech advancements, et cetera, autonomous train possibilities and that type of thing. They've got to protect mm -hmm. their the thing there. Uh, thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, let's bring on uh, Mike Bowdendistel and get his his take on what's going on here as well. Mike, uh, good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, good. How are you guys? We doing great. We're doing good as well. So let's kind of get your thoughts on this now as well. Does either side kind of have an upper hand in the side of these negotiations? Or is is one kind of leaning towards we're, we're going to solve these issues on our way or, or the other way? Well, I think when you have a Democrat in the White House and a democratically controlled Congress, Labor has the, the upper hand in these negotiations. And, um, you know, agree with Joanna's take just then that there's a win for the, the labor. Um, you know, what happened yesterday, getting re released from mediation. Uh, labor wants to push this uh, along quickly while there still is a democratically controlled Congress that might not be true early next year. So, um, you know, the, the clock starts to tick on the first 30-day thir uh, cooling off period if we're still talking about this 90 days from now. I don't think Congress is going to allow um, the, the rail network to be shut down and which would make inflation even worse, which would make farmers not be able to get crops to market. So, so that's not going to be, be allowed, maybe not for more than a, a day or two. So, so Congress is, is going to, in all likelihood, um, you know, if that happens, you know, take recommendations from a presidentially appointed board, so board that's sympathetic to you know, Joe, Joe Biden mm -hmm. and, you know, take the recommendations that it likes, which are probably going to be more labor friendly. So right now, I, I would say, you know, labor has the, the upper hand in negotiations. It would seem that they do, and they probably have uh, the upper uh, upper hand due to the fact that even just the 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 threat of this right now is something that could cause inflation and, and knee jerk reactions in the uh, in the markets, correct? That's right. I mean, nothing would be worse, I think, for the economy than a uh, rail um, strike that, you know, these rails are so interconnected that, you know, 115,000 you know, workers, I mean, there's just, it's, it's, it would just cripple the, the transportation, you know, networks. It would make it uh, international trade difficult. It would be a disaster. So, so Congress is not going to, 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 to allow that. But um, it's, it's sort of they have, they finally, it's kind of a situation where labor finally has some leverage because um, you know that they've been you know hard to to find workers for these jobs and train them in a, man, in a manner that's sufficient. It takes a long time to train them, um, you know, you know all, all, all of those things. So um, it, it does seem like labor finally has uh, you know the the negotiating power here. Mike, we're about two weeks out from the ILWU negotiations as well going on with longshoremen off the West Coast, mm -hmm. the port workers there, which could threaten this t same type of negotiation, same type of issues if they choose to not extend their contract too. Do you think that it's mm -hmm. kind of timely or almost kind of ironic that this is happening with both the rails and the ports at the same time? And if the rail situation gets sorted out, does that almost set a precedent for what has to happen with the ports as well? Well, I, I don't know if it says a precedent. I mean, there's two different, um, you know, situations there. Uh, so, but I mean, it, it does speak to the fact that, um, you know, really labor has more, I think, negotiating power now than it has had in in some time. I know the um, ILWU and the, the PMA, you know, released a joint statement said that they're going to work, you know, past July 1st, even if a contract is not in place, which it doesn't look like it's going to be in place at, at, at this point. But I think the, the concern was, was that, 
you know, if they're operating without, um, you know, a contract that there'd be a, a slowing and, you know, how productive they were, which would cause more buildup of ships. Um, you know, the, the, the ship, you know, queue has, has really come way down. I think Greg Miller's last article said 27, you know, ships, which is a lot better than the 100 plus than, than, than you have had. Yeah, absolutely. So, Michael, what's your take on on the uh, the, the 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 points of contention? You, you've got the uh, the the health and welfare that is that is their wages, uh, removing the conductor from the uh, the cab of of the train, as as Joanna uh, put it. Um, is that what the issue is here, or is there some of this te tech fight that you kind of hear and see in the uh, like with the ILW? Yeah, I mean, I thought Joanna did a really nice job describing the situation with um, the two-man mm -hmm. crews versus having one man, just a locomotive engineer in the cab and, you know, conductor on the ground. The two sides are not going to agree on that. Um, it, it's going to be, have to be something that, that Congress sorts out. I mean, the, the rails, I think, make the argument that technology advanced so much that, you know, do you even need one man in a crew since, you know, positive train control is a system mm -hmm. that's mandated throughout the, the United States that stops a train automatically if it misses a signal, if it's going too fast or something to, to, to prevent uh, collisions and, and, and derailments. So, um, you know, and, and union, I mean, they're going to be against like, anything that, that cuts their their ranks. So those, the two sides are just not going to agree on that. On, on some of the other things, I mean, you know, I think there's no question that the railroad and uh, unionized workers get paid, you know, really well when you compare it to most other um, you know, types of industrial jobs, maybe with the exception of the ILWU, which is is, is even even higher. But um, you know, I think the the the, the um, health insurance is something that sort of everyone deals with. But but that really the, that big sticking point is the um, is the the work rules. Gotcha. All right, Mike, thank you for joining us and adding your take on this topic as well. Great to have both of you guys as well. You can have, head over to FreightWaves.com and read Joanna's articles up on these issues as we continue to watch it. Right now, we're going to head over to The Wall. We've got our first carrier update this morning with Tony Mulvey and Donnie Gilbert.